Facebook. Okay, well, welcome everybody to um, a program out of the Foley Library of the Nevada County Public Library System. From Nevada County to the Outback, the Australian Connection. And today we have with us um, Gage McKinney, who is a wonderful local historian. He's written several books on history, particularly of this area. His most recent book is called Gold Mining Genius, A Life of George William Starr. Um, and he's done a lot of um, work with the Cornish in the area and so welcome Gage. Thank you for being here to share your expertise. Well, Laura, thank you. Uh, Laura at the Foley Library, one of my favorite places. And of course, thanks to the Nevada County Libraries for sponsoring this uh, program. And welcome to all of you who are here today and interested in Australia as uh, I am. Um, the Australia uh, Australian flag uh, uh, depicting the uh, uh, Southern Cross is beside me. And on the screen in front of us is a uh, map of, uh, of Australia. And so we'll be talking about uh, New South Wales, which is in the uh, uh, right uh, lower uh, quadrant. Um, and that's where Sydney is. Um, so it's maybe the most familiar part of Australia to Californians because uh, there are at least six U.S. flights every day from uh, Cal California to Sydney, and then you can add in uh, the um, uh, the Australian and the other foreign airlines who fly that that same route. Um, west of uh, New South Wales is uh, the state of South Australia. Australia and the city of Adelaide, which we'll talk about quite a bit. Out west, of course, is uh, is uh, Western Australia. Uh, Queensland, uh, we'll be talking about, oh, and it shows up on the map, Charters Towers, um, which is a settlement in Queensland that we will be talking about. And of course, maybe the state that has the most in common with our particular region, of California, and that is the state of um, um, Victoria um, in the Southeast. <clears throat> so we'll be talking about, as we see a historic uh, uh, photograph appear, we'll be talking about um, the history of this region and Australia, but our relationship with that continent and country um, is is an ongoing ongoing thing and it's because we have so much in common um, the climate of um, much of Australia uh, the 25 million people who live there most of them live within just a few miles of the coast and so their climate is very much like California very much like Southern California particularly uh, the uh, topography is similar, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit when we talk about the mining enterprises. Of course, the architecture in California and, uh, and Australia borrow from one another, and California particularly borrows from Australia. And whenever you see a house with a veranda all the way around it, um, that's a a style of architecture that, that was brought here and especially to Southern California from, from Australia. Um, our, our irrigation uh, schemes, especially in the uh, Imperial Valley, were uh, very much informed by irrigation in Australia. And of course we have the eucalyptus trees, um, all along the central coast, um, cushioning uh, fields from the winds uh, off of the ocean and uh, not so much anymore since uh, the tragic fires uh, in Oakland and the East Bay because the eucalyptus with all the oil is um, carries such a load of fuel. Uh, but uh, we do have uh, uh, Australian trees all over our state. 
And then, uh, well, we, sh we share wine. Um, uh, wine is one of Australia's uh, best imports, um, most productive imports. And we'll talk a little about their, their wine countries as, as we tell the story. Our part of California has a particular place in Australian history. Australia was being settled quite a while before California was being settled by Euro Europeans, uh, especially English speaking, English speaking people. And, but it developed very quickly after the California gold rush. News of our gold rush got to Sydney almost as quickly as it got to the East Coast of the United States. And when it reached Sydney in the winter of 1848-1849, it was an economic slump in Australia. So many people there were interested in trying their luck in, Cal in California and whole boatloads of them immediately left for San Francisco and to such an extent that the newspapers in Sydney and elsewhere in Australia were trying to discourage people from leaving because it was having a, a further impact on their economy. Now, one of the people who came was a man named uh, Edward Hammond Hargraves. And Mr. Hargraves didn't know anything about mining when he came here, but he got to San Francisco and then found his way to the gold mining country, um, hoping to make his fortune, of course. And he found, him, he found his way right here to our own region. And he was prospecting al along the Yuba River and looking around at the country right here around what would become Nevada County, it occurred to him, as he recorded later, that he had seen similar country in Australia. And so after not being especially successful in California, he went back to Australia, arriving in their summer, that would be January, of 1851, and he went out from Sydney about 100 miles northwest and started prospecting for gold. Now, people had claimed to have found gold out in that region, but other people denied the claims and no one was certain. And Hargraves went out there with uh, two Cornishmen, uh, by the surname of Toms, and they prospected in New South Wales, and they found very similar to what had been found in California, a quartz vein containing gold. This was after they found gold in a stream nearby. And Australia was organized in quite a different way than California, of course, the United States acquired California in a war of conquest with Mexico. And when gold was discovered, uh, we had a military government here. A civil government had not yet been established. And the military government was not especially interested in trying to manage or uh, impose any kind of rule over the gold country. So it was sort of winner take all. Uh, the gold belonged to them who found it, as the saying was among the, four, the 49ers. In New South Wales and in Australia generally, metals belong to the crown, minerals belong to the crown. So what Mr. Hargrave's actual motive was, was to win a reward, be given a reward by the crown for finding gold. And so Rather than going out and prospecting and making his own claim, he did some of that. But mostly what he did, he publicized it. 
and encouraged other people to join a gold rush to New South Wales. And that was the beginning of what the um, great mining historian of Australia, Jeffrey Blaines, called the rush that never ended. And it was the beginning of uh, gold rushes in, in Australia. And once people started mining in New South Wales, there were people from the next colony over, what is now the state of Victoria, saying, well, we have, we have country like this in our state too. And so soon thereafter, a couple years later, there was an, another and an even greater gold rush to uh, Victoria, Australia. And so that's really how the, the early histories of California and Australia are intertwined. Um, there are more layers to the story. Of course, we know gold was discovered here by James Marshall uh, in a mill race uh, when he built a sawmill uh, or was building a sawmill. And there had actually been a discovery in, um, in Victoria, even before James Marshall's mill, of a similar situation in a mill race of a, of a, um, uh, a wheat mill in Victoria. Gold had actually been found, but the people who found it dismissed it and said, no, no, it's not gold, it's only mica. So uh, very, very similar histories to the, um, to the two places. And so this is um, um, carried out later on in the, in the actual stories of the people who went to Australia and the people who came to California or went to California. And um, so the two places become even more intertwined in in the lives of people who uh, who knew both places. And so just to mention one of those people, and then maybe I'll take a pause and, and see if there's any questions about this introductory part, but I'll just mention someone everybody knows, our most famous local miner, and that was Herbert Hoover, who began his... Uh, mining career. He, of course, graduated from Stanford with a degree in mining geology in the first Stanford class in 1895. And then immediately came to Nevada City, boarded on Broad Street, and got his practical experience as a miner in the mines uh, near Nevada City, uh, especially the uh, Champion Mine. And um, when he got his first overseas assignment, he went to work for a mining firm in San Francisco and they sent him to uh, Western Australia. And he spent a year there prospecting and identified a site and established a mine called the Sons of, uh, Sons of Gowala Mine in uh, Western Australia, and that became Herbert Hoover's first fortune, and he made that fortune before he was 25 years old. And he had more success in Australia after that on his way to first a fabulous mining career and then his uh, career in government ad ad administration in the uh, Woodrow Wilson at uh, administration and then as president of the United States himself. So I've got a few stories to tell about local people and but before I just pause here and see if there's anything anyone wants to add or anyone has has uh, questions. And then there's a few ways that you could ask a question. You could um, type your question into chat. You could unmute yourself and ask it. 
Um, and then Casey um, is also monitoring over on Facebook and she'll be able to tell us in a few minutes if there are any questions on there. But it looks like Eric, you've unmuted yourself. Did you have a question? <clears throat> well, we watched on Smithsonian TV the other night, a program called Mighty Trains. And they did the Indian Pacific uh, train in Australia that goes all the way across country. And they said if it weren't for the gold mining in Australia, that was the way they got gold in and out and all this stuff. Pretty interesting. It was four day trip, something like 4,300 kilometers long. And, um, you know, it goes through unbelievable territory in Australia. But that was primarily because of the gold that they found there in Australia. So, and one other thing I wanted to say, uh, there's an Australian native plant nursery down outside of Ventura that all really? they sell is stuff from Australia and some are really fantastic plants. So if you ever get an urge to go see some Australian plants, also the University of Santa Cruz has a whole Australian um, forest area and trees and plants and stuff too. So. Um, so Australia, there's there's a lot to do with Australia here in California. But, Here's yeah. just a, it's a painting that I have in my office and I really bought it really because it just captures the color of Australia. And this is a scene in, in uh, it happens to be in South Australia, but, but I, but I think you can see the same uh, palette uh, of the plain air artists who uh, were painting early in the 20th century in, in Southern California. And those artists who founded the Laguna Beach Art Museum and painted in the, uh, in the San Gabriel Valley and uh, north of Los Angeles. And then of course, uh, further east. Michael, did you have a question? We can't hear. I can see you speaking, but I can't hear you. Oh, I'm, I'm having trouble with the microphone on this machine. I'm sorry. I, can there, other people hear him? I can. Not Sounds not. like he's saying he's got some trouble with his microphone. Okay. Are you able to type the question into chat? Casey, are you able to catch any of this? No, I didn't hear anything that time. I'm so sorry, Michael, but we can't hear you at all. Is there a way you could type your question into the chat field? If you go, uh, I think it's up in the top right, you should be able to, there's like a, a, a balloon with a, you know, like a in a cartoon you would see it. And if you click on that, you should get a chat screen where you could type a message. I'm sorry. Um, maybe we could come back to you, Michael. We're still not able to hear you. Casey, are there any questions over on Facebook? I don't see anything on Facebook. Okay. Well, we'll keep watching to see if a, mess if a message comes through from you, Michael. Okay. So let's talk about a few Nevada County people who historically and continuing on today have had roots in Australia. And so we've got some, some images of these people to go uh, with the story and Casey's gonna put them up now. And so the first person we're, we're going to talk about is uh, Johnny Thomas. And John Thomas was born in St. Just's Cornwall, and as a young man, he sailed out to Australia, he and his brother, and they went to that northeastern province that we saw on the map called Queensland. And by the 1890s, there had been a gold rush in Queensland, and it had become the biggest Gold, uh, gold 
producing state of Australia. And the big gold camp, the big gold town in Queensland was called Charters Towers. And so it was very much the grass valley of Queensland, Australia. And it, um, it became prosperous. It had the big houses like our, like our Empire Cottage or our North Star House. And it had a, a churches, a downtown area with, with all the latest products. And it was the part of Australia, curiously, British investors were not very keen on Australia. We had more British investment here in Nevada County, especially. And also there was British investment in Mexico and South America. We had more British in investment in the Americas than in Australia, but Charters Towers changed that. It, it was such a big gold find. And then it was so cleverly promoted in London. As a matter of fact, they took a stamp mill and ore from the mine and Charters Towers to London and milled it right there in front of audiences in London. And this promoted tremendous investment. John Thomas was there, well, a little after sort of the height of the boom and he was involved in metallurgy. And then things started to fall off in um, Queensland as far as mining, largely because gold had been, been discovered way out west in Western Australia. And this was the gold boom that Herbert Hoover was part of. And then this has to do with those railroads that Eric was talking about, because there was this great migration from the east of the country to, to the west. And those railroads were built to open up that, that western mining. And instead of going out west, where everyone else seemed to be going in Australia, uh, John Thomas got on a ship and went to San Francisco. And he wandered around the American West a bit. Uh, his particular skill was in metallurgy, was working in the mill. And there was a lot of demand for that in copper country, especially up in Butte, Montana, where he worked. But he found his way to Grass Valley and they made the rest of his life here. So around his neck is a medal. John Thomas was a great musician and especially a great singer, a memorable baritone voice. And he won that medal in a singing competition in Charters Towers. And here in Grass Valley, we had this, we had this very lively, and it goes back to the mining days, this very lively music scene. And this particularly involving amateur musicians and uh, performers and singers and John Thomas was part of that in Queensland, and then he came here to Grass Valley and became a big part of the music scene. And he became the director in about 1910 of our Grass Valley Cornish Carol Choir. And that's the same carols and the legacy of the same choir that still sings every year at Cornish Christmas on on Mill Street. And John Thomas was a longtime director of that choir. And he was probably the person who brought with him Cornish Carols published in Australia, because we have a book in our Cyril's uh, library collection of <clears throat> something called The Christmas Welcome, which was a collection of Cornish Carols published in Australia. And it was used here by the um, Grass Valley Carol Choir. And, but going back the other way, we had a director of the choir here <clears throat> a little before John Thomas's time named John Code, 
who actually wrote Cor Cornish Carols, and he left Grass Valley to go to Australia, where he had a wonderful career as a musician <clears throat> in um, in South uh, South Australia. So John Thomas and John Code sort of changed places, and John Thomas <clears throat> met a girl here in Grass Valley, Margaret Heather, and <clears throat> they were. They were from the same village in uh, Cornwall, <clears throat> a place called St. Just Way Out West. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> I'll try to get my voice back. And uh, <clears throat> so possibly they knew one another in, in Cornwall, but they, they married here. And <clears throat> in the Masonic Temple, in the Masonic Lodge on South Auburn Street in Grass Valley, there is a is a wonderful grand p piano and it is dedicated to the memory of john and margaret thomas so <clears throat> their musical heritage their musical legacy is still remembered in grass valley now someone else <clears throat> and i told laura about um Mrs. Uh, Polkinghorn, Annie Martin Polkinghorn. And I had said she too had gone to Australia. I was a little bit mistaken. <clears throat> she had gone actually to New, New Zealand. But when you're looking at from 8,000 miles away, <clears throat> things get a little blurred. But she does show us something about the heritage of that part of the world, and especially how people in the 19th century, and especially these Cornish mining families, how they traveled. So Annie was actually conceived in Cornwall, in my ancestral town of Redruth, which was an old mining town. Um, her mother crossed the Atlantic, uh, bearing um, Annie, and Annie was born in Pennsylvania. And um, the family mined in America for a time, and they first came to California by train after the railroad was built, and Annie was born about 1881. And, but they were en route to join up with other family from Cornwall who had immigrated to New Zealand. And so they tried New Zealand for a few years. It didn't work out for them. They were probably interested in farming there. And so they came back to California and they uh, settled at the Guadalupe mine, which is south of San Jose, about 12 miles south of San Jose. And it, it was one of the largest mercury mines in California. And during the uh, gold era, in this state and during the industrial era um, up until about 1900, mercury was the essential uh, element in refining gold. And so they lived there at, at Guadalupe and uh, there Annie uh, learned to speak sp uh, Spanish as a girl because there was a large corner settlement there, but there was an even larger settlement of skilled miners from the silver mines of Mexico and the gold and copper mines of, of uh, Chile. And then the family came to Grass Valley where uh, Annie spent most of her life, most of the rest of her life. She lived on Wall Street. She married a Mr. Polkinghorn. Polkinghorn is a very common Cornish name and they lived across the street from Emmanuel Episcopal Church. They were very evolved, uh, involved at the Methodist Church on South Church Street. Annie, a big part of the musical scene there. And then she also had a unique function with the Cornish Carols and the Cornish Carol Choir. She was the woman for 40 years who trained the boy altos. And up until the 1990s, the uh, carol choir 
had boys to sing the alto parts. And the Cornish carols are a simple four-part harmony, a much influenced by the music of the Methodist Chapel, also by the mu uh, music of, of, Heid of uh, Handel. And so Annie trained those boys to sing the alto part in that four-part harmony. Now, when Eleanor Kennetzer took over the carol choir in about 1990, um, she realized that what the choir needed to continue was to let women sing in the choir. And there was something of an uproar and uh, people say, well, that's not the history of the choir. It's always been a men's choir. Well, um, that's not true. Women sang in the choir, especially during World War I, when there was a shortage of men. But Annie, who trained the boy altos, we know, also sang in the Cornish Carol Choir for years and years. And we know it because one of those boy altos named Harold George, who later himself was a director of the choir, Harold George remembered her standing behind the boy altos and singing the alto part with them to encourage the boys along. And so uh, Annie uh, Pokinghorn just stands as an emblem, not only of our local associations with people in the summer, Southern Hemisphere, but also with uh, the fact that uh, uh, women con contributed just as much to the Cornish music as men did. And so that brings me to the story of the best family. And this was a remarkable family of people with a remarkable story. This is the best shoe store. And it was at 112 Mill Street in Grass Valley. And if you walk to 112 Mill Street today, there's still a shoe store there. And there has been a shoe store there since uh, about the 1880s. So the Best family, they started in the China Clay District which is the south coast, central south coast of Cornwall. And it's where the clay was mined for Wedgwood China and other brands of English China. And as well as being hard rock miners, mining tin and, and copper and other metals, the Cornish were also China clay miners. The best family were really farmers. Uh, they had uh, been farming in Cornwall for probably a thousand years. And they had migrated about 16 miles in, it took them hundreds of years and through family connection, through marriages and inheriting a farm a little further on and a little further on. They migrated from the county town of St. Bodman and its environs to the uh, town near the south coast of uh, St. Austell, which is the center of the China clay country. And so in the 19th century, when families started becoming much larger than they had been, uh, largely because of public health measures and better sanitation, the younger boys, there wasn't enough room on the farm for all the sons. And so the younger boys had to take up other occupations. And a man named uh, William Best, who was born in 1823, uh, became a China clay miner. And he, he fell in love with a girl he met at the Methodist Chapel in St. Austell. And her father, who had deceased, but while he lived, uh, she had been rather prosperous and he had been the manager of a China clay operation. And then after he died, 
she had become a servant in the home of a of a wealthier family. So they met during hard times in Cornwall in, in the late 1840s. And the potato famine that we so associate with Ireland, well, it affected Cornwall also. Uh, potatoes weren't the essential crop in Cornwall as they were in Ireland. So the impact was uh, less, but still very profound. And so it was very hard times. And so in the late 1840s, William and uh, his wife, Margaret, uh, married in St. Austell and almost immediately got on a ship and sailed to the colony of South Australia. So in several hundred years, their family had migrated 16 miles. In three months, William and Margaret migrated 16,000 miles. And the route uh, from um, Southampton, uh, south of London, where they traveled was was down um, the um, west coast of, of Europe and Africa and around the Cape of Good Hope and then out to Australia, um, east to Australia. Took them about three three months. Their first child was born in Australian waters just before they made landfall at Adelaide in South Australia. And so uh, Margaret was was uh, carrying a child through that um, um, that long uh, difficult journey to South Australia. Now the circumstances of the stay there suggest that William was recruited and had a contract to work for a year. When they arrived, the gold rush had started. Uh, relatively close by, by a few hundred miles away. Uh, um, not a difficult journey by ship, by coastal ship in Victoria. And so, so many of the miners had left South Australia and gone to Victoria to join the gold rush. These were mostly Cornish miners and it depleted the mines and many of the um, South Australian mines, which were copper mines. It's one of the richest copper mining areas in the world. Um, so many of the mines were just short of labor. So William and Margaret were there for a year, which suggests that he had a contract to fulfill. And then after a year, he, he was working in the hills just outside of Adelaide, which are beautiful because uh, from those hills, you had a beautiful view of looking out um, looking out over the ocean. It's uh, something like being at, at Malibu or being at, at, uh, at Pacific Heights and uh, looking out over, over the ocean there. And so they lived there, there near Adelaide. And then they too joined the gold rush to um, South Australia. And they lived in a gold camp called um, Quesic. And uh, there they lived under tents for several years. And only slowly did the town uh, develop and were buildings actually built. When they got there in about 1852, just the first buildings were starting to be built in this, in this mining camp. Well, nonetheless, whether they were living under canvas or under shingles, they had several children there. And actually all of their children, I believe there were um, three boys and three, three girls, and they were all born in Australia. One of the boys, his name was John, and he came down with something called um, um, bone, bone pneumonia, um, which is in undeveloped countries today, um, not uncommon. And so his one leg did not develop properly, was shorter than the other. 
the family was successful enough that they all got on a ship back to England, which meant they haven't had enough money to take the time off to travel back to England and enough money to pay their passage all the way back. And they settled and they sailed back to England because they had heard of a doctor there who could treat the boy. And they uh, had the boy treated by this doctor. They visited, visited their family in Cornwall. And so as they made that trip, they completed a circumnavigation, their own circumnavigation of the globe, something their ancestors could have never imagined. But they had no intentions of staying in the United Kingdom. They had saw too many of the opportunities that immigration could offer. So they went to a very popular place for Cornish miners to go. And that was to the upper peninsula of Michigan. And they went to, um, to the Keweena Peninsula, a very rich copper area. And uh, William Best and his two oldest sons worked in the copper mines there. And the John, uh, the, the son who now had a lift in one shoe so he could walk with almost a normal gait, became an apprentice to a bootmaker, a German bootmaker. And thereby, he acquired the German language, and he also uh, became a master uh, boot maker himself. The family had heard about a place called Grass Valley, with certainly a much better climate than they had on the upper peninsula of Michigan with its harsh winters. And so they all um, uh, set sail. Uh, initially for Chicago, and then got on the train to California, made their way to Grass Valley, settled here, uh, rented a house initially on Henderson Street, uh, owned houses eventually uh, as the family grew and the sons married, and they had several homes. Uh, they were all sort of clustered on, um, on Race Street in Grass Valley. William Best had experience as a prospector in Victoria, Australia. And so he began prospecting around Grass Valley. And he found a likely piece of ground that he was able to claim. And this was uh, in the, about 1890. And it's a piece of ground, if you do much hiking in this area, you may know, because there's a trail, it's called the Memorial Park Trail, and it goes from roughly the entrance of the Empire Mine State Park and the entrance of the Visitor Center at the park, down um, through, uh, across East Empire Street, across past picnic tables, and down a path towards Empire, uh, towards the Memorial Park, past the tennis courts. And, and that's a slope going downward. And along that slope was William Best's claim. And it was a very successful claim. And he took enough gold out of that claim so that he was able to retire at he was about 60 years old by this time. And the, the man who bought the claim from him, and this helped to make him rich too, was William Bourne, the, the owner of the Empire Mine. In the meantime, son John uh, was making his career as a uh, boot maker in Grass Valley, making custom boots and shoes, and then also opening a shoe store originally with a partner. And then eventually he had the best shoe store at uh, 112 um, Mill Street in Grass Valley. And so here's a picture of uh, John Best um, at, at his shoe store. 
pitch, picture is probably circa 1910. And you can see all the um, factory made shoes on display. He was still making custom shoes. And of course, all manner of shoe repair and leather work and leather repair as well. He was one of the best known and most successful merchants in Grass Valley. He operated that store for over 40 years and then retired to his own home on Ray Street, a native of uh, born under canvas in Victoria, Australia. So he's one of our local roots there. Of course, we have plenty of people living here now who come from Australia, uh, a, a sales manager at uh, Calis, uh, California Solar Company, um, a, um, the manager, or the uh, director maybe of the uh, South Yuba Club on uh, uh, East Main Street. And in the Southern Hemisphere, there is a journalist named Nick Durga, N-I-K-D-I-R-G-A, Nick Durga, and he's got a website, nickdurga.com. And he is actually based now in New Zealand, but he does a lot of work for Australian newspapers. He also is a primary source for Radio New Zealand. And he has a blog and one of Nick's function, he's a graduate of Nevada Union High School. And one of his functions in the Southern Hemisphere is interpreting American politics for people in Australia and New Zealand. And um, as much trouble as we may have understanding our own politics, Nick is trying to make them explainable to people so many thousand miles away. So we still have those, those uh, connections with the Southern Hemisphere and Australia is, I think, Cal one of California's largest trading partners. And one of the products that we buy the most of is uh, Australian wines. And most of you are probably acquainted with their most famous brand, their largest selling brand, which is called Yellowtail. They have um, mine, uh, they have wine regions around the, um, uh, around the continent, uh, from West Australia up to uh, Queensland. Ilka, my wife Ilka and I have spent time in the Clare Valley and in Barossa Valley which are two mine regions of South Australia, beautiful places, resort places, uh, very much like our Napa Valley. Clare Valley is, is uh, Napa Valley on a smaller, uh, on a smaller scale and, and, and a quieter pace, maybe like Napa Valley used to be. And so there's still plenty of uh, connections with Australia, the most dire, ones, of course, at the moment have to do with climate change and with wildfires, our common experience, and with the fact that we share fire resources. Um, there, of course, fire season being um, the opposite end of the calendar than ours, uh, both of our fire seasons being extended, of course, so we actually s share fire resources with them. So, that's uh, a take on how we were connected with Australia and have been historically and how we continue to be connected with them today. So maybe, uh, uh, Laura, you have questions or maybe there's more questions from um, some of the people who have tuned in. Well, I was kind of wondering since uh, obviously it, it was there was the Cornish um, people were were moving around to all these places. One of the things that I was wondering is, was this part of kind of the the Cornish typical like the group personality 
to be this adventurous and to go all these different places? Or was it just kind of a, um, was it like just a, a condition of the times with the, with the potato famine and, the, and problems with the copper mining in Cornwall that, that people started just moving around and then they got the, got the bug? It just, it just seems like such a, such an, a brave thing to do, particularly at that time, to just come pick up and move all the way around the world really seems an incredible thing to do, doesn't it? And, yeah. and when you think of the distances, you know, uh, 16,000 miles from um, St. Austell to Adelaide, uh, I mean, it just seems remarkable. Three months on a sailing ship. Yeah. And it was, it's in some sense indicative of British people too, but it's particularly indicative of the Cornish because the Cornish were and uh, still are uh, a mining people because theirs was one of the principal mining regions of Europe going back to ancient times. They provided tin uh, especially to uh, in the Roman era and, and uh, even before uh, to the Bronze Age era. And, but they, as well as being a mining people, they are very much a maritime people. And so some of the early settlers in New England were also Cornish people, not, not miners, but Cornish mariners, because they were sailing ships. And in the 19th and 18th century, even the 17th century, uh, the Cornish ports, especially of Falmouth and of Padstow, were major shipping ports uh, coming to North America, uh, uh, coming to uh, Canada and to New England. And so the Cornish already had some of this in their blood, especially when they were from coastal communities. I talked about St. Just. St. Just is a mining camp that overlooks the sea. And so you get this kind of combination of mining and, and maritime heritage. And so they were predisposed to do that. And then because British capital opened up mining all over the world and especially in Mexico. And this was as soon as the Napoleonic Wars ended. It was really the first era of globalization as we know it, that is of capital and technology and people going overseas um, to export um, resources there. The Cornish, I mean the English started investing in silver mines in Mexico by the early 1820s. And they sent Cornish miners because they knew where the best miners were. And so the Cornish started settling in Mexico in the 1820s, in, in South America, especially Chile, uh, shortly thereafter. And then when Australia, when copper was discovered in South Australia, in Australia too. So the maritime heritage and the mining heritage really were part of um, sort of what, what um, encouraged the Cornish to move out into this global economy. And so we talk about, we talk about Cornish migration, we talk about pull factors and push factors. And so the push factors <clears throat> are things I talked about, like the potato famine, like the fact that families were suddenly larger and you had all these younger sons. If you had a, if, if you had a farm that probably went to the eldest son uh, and you had all these younger sons who had to make their way and many boys were encouraged go go overseas my son and so those were push factors and then the pull factors there were people overseas as in the case of William Best recruiting Cornish miners so the new Almaden quicksilver mine 
south of San Jose, ran full page advertisements in Cornish newspapers, recruiting miners come to California to mine. Mm -hmm. And many mining operations in Australia did the same type of thing. And then you had the British government had their own migration schemes as well, where they were signing people up because they wanted people to go populate these new British, British colonies. Um, and so those were sort of pull factors, things pulling people overseas, as well as just wages. When William Best went to work, Uh-oh, Gage is frozen. Gage. South Australia, as much as he made in a month in Cornwall. I think I got it right that time. We lost you for a minute. You froze. But I think we got it now. Oh, well, it was all stimulating stuff, I'm sure. <laughs> It was so stimulating, the internet could not handle it. <laughs> Cage, did many of these uh, guys that went overseas, did many of them go back to Cornwall to live? Was there any desire to go back? Sure. So there's been, just in recent years, I mean, just in the 10, 10 or 15 years, studies on that, um, and not only the Cornish, but other European uh, immigrants, something like maybe half of the Italians went back, uh, went back to Italy. Sort of the figures suggest maybe a quarter, maybe even a third of the Cornish went back. And so you see evidence of this in Cornwall today, because, um, you know, in Cornwall, uh, when you're, um, when you're successful, your house doesn't have a number. It doesn't have a street number. It has a name. And so there are many California houses in, in Cornwall. And there are also other places like Virginia City houses. Um, and so you see place names, especially from California, on houses in Cornwall. And of course, in Bodmin, Cornwall, they have a housing development today. It's fairly new. And it's called Grass Valley. So, uh, so Grass Valley is still a magic name in Cornwall. And what it means is you went overseas, you were a big success, you bought a, brought a bundle home and set yourself up well. So um, a sizable number of them uh, went back. Um, a lot of the uh, uh, women especially uh, wanted to go back. There are families <clears throat> who went back for the purposes of raising their children in Cornwall and probably around the grandparents and then returned to America after the children were raised. So there's a lot of different patterns, but clearly the, the, the most common pattern was they came to America, they were here for five years and they got their citizenship. That was what happened to the overwhelming number of Cornish immigrants. <clears throat> yeah, we were at a train station in Amsterdam and there were four people from Cornwall and they found out it was from Grass Valley. They were all excited. <laughs> so there was a connection. See, over in Cornwall, they know where Grass Valley is, so. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Uh, 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 Ilka and I had the the experience that was this was thirty five years ago or something, walking into a, the county records office, and we were looking for the way, talking to one another as we approached the counter, and they heard our accents, and they said, "Oh, you must be from Grass Valley." <laughs> oh God. <laughs> That's pretty well, good. Are there are there any other questions or Casey? Is there anything over on Facebook? So it's just about it's just three oh one now. I don't see anything on Facebook, uh, but it looks like some Michael. Yeah. Oh, great. Michael just posted and says information I have shows family members 
moving to Alaska and, and Washington and British Columbia. There were many trips between Cornwall and North America. My grandmother traveled to Cornwall back to the US with a trip north to the Juneau area of Alaska and Washington. Wow, so Can't there's- so Cornish in one spot, can you? There's a real, I mean, I mean, Michael's really got yeah. uh, a, a really complex uh, immigrant story back and forth. Mm -hmm. Not only here, there was, uh, Cornish people wanted, a lot of them really wanted to be farmers. They were just mining until they could buy a farm and, and, and a cow. And, um, and so there are a lot of Cornish families in Washington um, state. And there's a book on that in, in the Foley Library with a beautiful title, Ever Westward the Land, about Cornish people in Washington state. And then, of course, the mining in Alaska drew so many Cornish people. So uh, Michael's got a really great story there. <clears throat> Didn't a bunch end up in uh, South Africa as well? I'm not sure if you mentioned that already. I thought there so, was a diaspora there. South Africa, Johannesburg, um, was known in Cornwall as, as a suburb of Cornwall. So <laughs> many Cornish people went there directly from Cornwall, and they would leave their families at home for South Africa. That was a common pattern. The men were going to go out for a few years, make a bundle, and come back. And so um, the towns in Cornwall were really rich. This is 1890s. And um, then after the Boer War in the early, 19, uh, early 20th century. And the men were sending their wages home. And it made the towns in Cornwall uh, really prosperous. And it was the remittances from South Africa doing it. But something here, it's a story um, that hasn't really been told, although some of the George Starr book uh, that Laura held up at the beginning tells his story. We had this tremendous outflow of miners from Nevada County to Johannesburg. Mm. And George Starr, who was a general manager for about 40 years of the Empire Mine, he spent five years in, in South, um, South Africa in Johannesburg, managing a whole collection of mines. And he took men with him in his wake. And um, other men from Grass Valley went there as well. And many of them were recruited because by the 1890s, the British investors had figured something out. And that is that the Americans made the best mining engineers. Hmm. And as one British investor put it, the British mining engineers want to knock off at three in the afternoon to play tennis. And the German engineers want to knock off in the afternoon to drink beer. But the American drinks, uh, works all through the evening. Okay. And, um, and, and so um, it, Americans from Grass Valley were recruited to go work in South Africa. That's sort of a whole nother story. But it just shows how this region is really connected globally, going back to our industrial era 100 and 150 years ago. Well, we could probably keep going into the evening just hearing all your fascinating stories and asking you questions, but we do have to wrap it up now. So I wanted to thank Gage very much for sharing his time and his expertise and um, I want, also want to thank everybody for, for being here and for, um, for learning along with me. So thank you very much. And thank you all very much. Thanks, thanks for uh, being here. And um, well, if you had as much fun as I did, it, it was a good time. You definitely did. And in two weeks, on the 27th of July at 2 p.m., we're the Foley's um, sponsoring or we're hosting a program about Italian genealogy, totally not anything to do with what we're talking about today, but about uh, how to research your family if you have Italian roots. So if that interests you, we hope that you will join us then. Another big part Thank of, of uh, Nevada County's story. Yes. Yeah.
Yeah, very interesting. 